Good morning, you two pie smokers. I figured I'd uh, jump on the bandwagon, so to speak, and uh, give my opinion on the subject that's been circulating. Can a corn cob smoke as good as a briar pipe? Or can you compare a smoke from a corn cob pipe or a cheap pipe to a high end pipe? And I'll give you my opinion, and I'm not a pipe expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I've smoked them for a fair amount of time. Um, I own many pipes from high end to the cheapest to even homemade crap that I made. So um, I think I can have a strong opinion on this. And I think to really do this justice, you'd have to do a blind uh, fold test even to the hardened people that are adamant that a corn cob cannot smoke good or I think if you had a way of making all the mouthpieces similar where they couldn't tell by the mouthpiece <clears throat> I think the results would be shocking now we've all had a pipe that smoked phenomenal for some reason and then sometimes you can never get that smoke out of that pipe again. And people call it the Nirvana experience or that, just that experience that you wish the bowl would never end. Um, I've had it happen a few times and sometimes you can't duplicate it maybe for a year later uh, or, or longer. I think it's circumstances. It happens to be the pipe was at the right um moisture content in the tobacco, the pipe was uh, just perfectly um, set up in a manner that it had the right amount of uh, cake on it, the temperature happened to be right, your taste buds happened to be in line that day, uh, I think there's many factors, but, and I've gotten that on many different pipes over the years, so you can clearly say it's not that pipe that caused it. It was some other uh, experience that mingled in that. But the point is, like in anything, uh, you can buy here's a 19 millimeter socket that happens to be made by Milwaukee. And let's say this, for argument's sake, is $10. The snap-on version of this would be $30. Both will get the job done. No problem. Um, but you're paying for name in many cases. Now, Snap-on, you're paying for branding. You're paying for the lifetime warranty, although this comes with a lifetime warranty as well. And it's not... you got to understand something. Iconic brands are not the same today that they were when they started. I'll give you an example. Snap-on built their reputation because they had tools that no one else offered. And they were innovators, innovators for the most part. Um, now I'm talking about tools now because there's a connection between pipes and tools and any, anything, cars. Over the years, between machining getting better and um, many circumstances, Snap-on is no longer the greatest tool company they once was, because there's many alternatives now, like this, that are very good and can compete with Snap-on at a third of the price. <clears throat> and there's a lot of things like that. Now, you also have people that if you're going to go into business, you can take two roads, really, or many roads, but you can cater to a higher-end people, like, I've, I, I can show you or steer you to shops that cater to high-end customers. And I consider a high-end customer that owns exotic cars. And I put Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, Audi, uh, most European cars in that category. And you can white-glove your shop and paint the floors and have the beautiful waiting room with the big screen TV and... You could command three to four hundred dollars an hour, and uh, 
because you're you're catering to a crowd that doesn't look at money as an obstacle. They're getting the same service in many cases of another good reputation shop that doesn't have all those features, but it doesn't work for them because they don't feel as good going to that shop as they do to this beautiful catered to type environment. <clears throat> a lot of things are like that. So you get a lot of pipe makers that feel if they're going to spend hours making pipes, they're going to cater to a customer that they feel their pipe is worth to them. So that's what I think drives pipes to the prices they drive. I mean, let's face it, you could take a square block of briar. You ever get, you ever see those pre-made briar blocks that are basically a pipe and you just have to shape them? The holes are drilled and everything. You could do nothing to that, smoke that pipe and get a good pipe smoke out of it. And it looks like, like nothing. It looks like a, uh, a square block with a, a stem in it. Plus, if you read, it takes time to build up a cake in the pipe. So once you build up the cake, the material underneath really has little value, in my view. And anyway, the, the biggest problem is it's really not measurable. Now, one argument was made, well, if you only smoke corn cob pipes, you, could, you really can't judge and say a $1,000 pipe, let's say, let's put some ceiling on it. Uh, that it smokes as good as that thousand dollar pipe. Now, granted there's some truth to that, because if you never experienced, how would you know? But, most pipe smokers talk to other pipe smokers, and logic has to come into a play here. And you're dealing with two holes, uh, the tobacco chamber and a, a hole to the mouthpiece. It's nothing, you know, it's not rocket science here. Um, and you're just burning tobacco. So you can almost say with certainty, without experiencing that high-end pipe, that it's going to be the same. And it's easy to draw that conclusion, but I don't think you could dismiss the guy that says that because he never smoked a $1,000 pipe. That's just my opinion. Now, where I do have more experience is with cars. And I see it all the time. But when we get people with Mercedes and uh, BMW, in most cases, not all, there's exceptions to everything, they think they bought the best car in the planet. Okay? And the reason I say that is because most Mercedes we work on have a total lack of maintenance. Because they think, because they bought this higher-end vehicle, it's made better, that they don't need to do the scheduled maintenance on it, and because it's made better. And that's the furthest thing from the truth, and that's where people get themselves in trouble. Most higher-end cars, and by the way, my personal feeling, I don't consider Mercedes a higher-end car anymore, because they really dropped the ball, in my opinion, but... Um, that put aside, it um, it's no better than a GM that's built today. So you have to understand, the playing field became very competitive over the years. And that's due to machinery and uh, CNC, basically. There's a lot of good cars out there now. I mean, most cars we see that we work on have... 150,000 mile plus on them with the original motor. That was unheard of years ago. Almost all manufacturers can get to that amount of mileage, if not more, by just changing the oil on a regular basis, and you have no problem getting to that kind of mileage. So the playing field has become somewhat level. It's the creature features, the leather interiors, the shape of the car, uh, the wheels, the tires, um, all those ornaments. But the tree, basically, without the ornaments, they're all similar. 
Now to further burst your bubble, I considered Mercedes one of the greatest car companies ever. But that was years ago. And the reason I say that, and most people that buy cars don't know this unless you work on cars, Mercedes was one of the few manufacturers that made everything in-house, and I admired that. They made their alternator, they made their uh, compressor, they made the engine, they made every part on that car was made by Mercedes. You take, um, and GM was a similar company, they made everything. They had all those spin-off Delphi, uh, the radios were made by GM, uh, the upholstery, everything was done in-house. And that's when you get the best quality of any product, in my view. Now they do all this outsourcing. And I can tell you, Jeep, Ford, uh, Dodge trucks, they all share the same transmission now. They all have German ZF transmissions that used to be exclusively for the Z, uh, BMW primarily. But they all do this outsourcing. And GM split a lot of their branches off. Uh, Delphi is a separate company now, so that you can find that in other things. Um, the world has changed in this marketing thing. Global economy, that means a lot more than you think it means. Um, because everything's intermixed now. Um, nothing's made by one manufacturer in most cases, Toyota is probably one of the few that still does a lot of in-house stuff. Um, GM still, but they, they have their other sold-off companies they made deals with supplying them. So technically, it's not under the one roof thing. <clears throat> you take tools, similar problem. Uh, Milwaukee is not the Milwaukee that you remember... As a kid, they were sold, Milwaukee, um, Rigid, uh, they're owned by the same company. So nothing's as it appears. Names were bought, uh, I call it uh, companies who arise themselves. Uh, John Deere did this with the John Deere's that are sold in Lowe's. They're not the same John Deere tractor you get from a John Deere dealer. Um... I've seen Snap-on branded knives and flashlights in Sam's Club. And I mentioned it to the tool guy that comes around with the truck. He said, we don't make that because they took a picture of my phone. They sold the license for somebody to put Snap-on name on some Chinese knife. So nothing's as it appears. So it's really hard. So somebody's going to buy that Snap-on knife in Sam's and say... I got a snap-on knife, but you got a piece of junk knife with a snap-on name on it. So somebody's trying to fool you, basically. It's like anything else. It's like buying a fake Rolex. I mean, um, and that's another good comparison. That's probably one of the few things that are still handmade uh, and worth their value is watches. But that's a uh, for another time. But what, I happen to be a watch fan, and watches are probably one of the few artisan type of businesses that still do it the old fashioned way for a lot of companies. And that's why you pay that premium price for certain Rolexes and different names. But in any subject, guitars, I know something about them. You know, Fender and Gibson has dominated the market for years. B.B. King played a Gibson. C. Ray Vaughan played a Fender. But they, because they were the innovators back in the day. Now, there's so many good Chinese guitars, because everything's made on CNC. You can buy a $100 guitar on uh, Amazon. And there's many YouTube videos about this. And they sound freaking phenomenal. And a friend, I had a 
guitars at one point in my life. And I used to have a really good friend. He passed away. He said, the sound is from your fingers, not the instrument. And he's so true. And if you follow some of the greats, um, Albert King, Steve Ray Vaughan, B.B. King, he could have picked up any electric guitar and sounded like them. Because the tone was in their hands and the instrument had little to do with it. So, matter of fact, there's a famous uh, YouTube video now uh, for years that that guy went into Walmart and played that plastic guitar and he happened to play a uh, Steve Ray Vaughan song. The video went viral and he went, wound up on TV and everything. It was that crappy plastic small child guitar that he sounded unbelievable on and um because the guy knew what he was doing you know he was good so the bottom line to all of this buy what you can afford don't let anybody tell you that you're a lesser of a person because you're smoking some cheap crap pipe it means nothing As a matter of fact you you should be the one laughing because you can almost say to spend a thousand dollars on a pipe is criminal. Uh, I won't go that far because you know it's all relative. If you're making six figures a year, what's a thousand dollar pipe? But to the guy that's making twenty five thousand, struggling to uh, meet his payments every month, you know that's a lot of money. So it's all relative. You don't got to make uh, $10 million a year and worry, oh man, uh, I can't buy that corn cob because I make so much money I'm going to buy a $10,000 pipe. And I'm sure there's a $10,000 pipe out there someplace. Damn, I went to a cigar store this weekend. It was a $600 cigar. One cigar. Now, I'm thinking to myself, matter of fact, it's been weighing heavy on my mind because of this subject and this cigar. Can that cigar be that much better to worth $600? Then I read up on it. It was a David off uh, Oro. They age the tobacco for 12 years. And then they take their veteran rollers that are 15 years or more experienced to roll that special blend of tobacco that they put in all aged for 12 years. So I get it. You're sitting on tobacco for a long time. In some storage that you're not touching for 12 years. Um, so I guess there's some value to that. But you really think it's going to smoke that much different? I'd like to hope so, but um, I won't be buying one. <laughs> I'd like to just to see if there's a uh, what what it's all about. That part of the curiosity got me, but I have a feeling it would be a disappointment. But it's still on my mind that, you know, I see it's the same thing when I went to a liquor store one day. There was a Boss Hog uh, liquor, a, a bourbon, that was $600, um, aged 20 years or something. And I'm wondering, is it really that much better. That's another slippery slope. Wine, <clears throat> wine fanatics will tell you you have to uh, spend a certain amount for a good wine. That's not true. Uh, you can buy, I've, I've had some three ninety nine bottles of wine that were phenomenal. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a wine, two buck chuck, I think it went up now, that Trader Joe sold that was a really well-rated wine uh, for two dollars. I think it's up to four dollars now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, unfortunately, by me, no Trader Joe sh sells liquor, but in Florida they do, and I've had it down there, and it is really good wine. And I've been with people that had money and went to a restaurant and ordered a three hundred dollar bottle of wine. And they had to send it back because it was terrible. So, price is relative. It's no longer you get what you pay for. You may think it is, but at the end of the day, it's really all smoke and mirrors.
in a lot of things. There are still some things that warrants, you know, price when you're dealing with diamonds and golds and that type of thing, but a pipe? I don't know. You know, there's that uh, pipe, a Weimer, like, I never, I'll screw up the name. I, I finally got to see him in person when I went to the Vegas Pipe Show. Total disappointment. The fit and finish was terrible. And his pipes command $1,000 and up. And he does some weird colors and weird shapes. And I got to tell you, the workmanship was substandard in my view. And, uh... But he's targeting that market, and somebody's buying them, because you go to smoking pipes, there's always a bunch of them that say sold, unless they're playing a game to make people think they're selling, which is possible. But I'm sure people are buying them, because uh, people with money, it's, you know, $1,000 to them is like uh, $200 to many people. So it's all, you know... What does it mean at the end of the day? It just means, like I said, many times. If you're smoking a thousand dollar pipe and you think it's better, the only thing you're showing me is you can afford a thousand dollar pipe, and God bless you. I'm glad you can. I hope you continue to be able to afford pipes like that. And but you're not smoking a better. You're not getting a better smoke than I am from a Savinelli, and I think. All the pipes I bought. There's no better pipe on this planet, in my view, than the company Savinelli. Their pipe, hands down, I have never had a bad Savinelli, ever. They're drilled almost all the time per uh, perfectly. The fit and finish is always great. That company has got it down to a science, and they sell... Their pipes are... Reasonably priced. The average seven L is a hundred dollars, ninety-five dollars for this pipe. Ninety-five dollars. Great. This is my favorite pipe. It's a matches type pipe. I have three of these. Best smoking pipe on the planet. Savinelli is a great pipe company, and they're smart because they make the lower end pipe like a Rossi. And they make the high-end artisan pipes. They really cover the bases. And the fit and finish can't be beat. It's a hard pipe to beat. Anyway, that's my opinion. I hope you gained something out of it. But um, buy what you can afford. Enjoy what you like. Don't let anybody, anybody, tell you you're wrong or can't be or... You don't know what you're talking about, because you know what? At the end of the day, if you smoke a pipe and you get an enjoyment out of it, that's all that matters. You can smoke a, uh, drink a good cup of coffee out of a paper cup. You don't need a, a $50 Yeti to have a good cup of coffee. What does this say? I can afford a, a Yeti. That's all it says. You can go to Walmart, get the spin-off for this for $20, and I've had compared them, and it keeps it as hot as a Yeti. But once you get the stupid Yeti name on it, the price goes up. <clears throat> I guarantee you, I bet you this is made in the same factory as the, the Walmart ones. They're all made in China. Matter of fact, to back up my claims, Snap-on was caught on uh, Harbor Freight. Uh, their jack at Harbor Freight was a third or less of the cost of the Snap-on jack. Snap-on sued them because it was identical. Snap-on lost the case. And uh, Harbor Freight printed the story on one of their flyers. And the jack was, in fact, made in the same factory as, uh, in China, as Snap-On's Jack. Harbor Freight was a little rougher fit and finish because they went an extra step, but uh, the guts of the Jack, everything was, you can swap parts, no problem. And uh, that really hurt Snap-On a lot. 
So that goes to show you, things aren't always what they seem to be. Especially now. 10, 20 years ago, I'd say no. When you saw something with a Snap-on name on it, you were buying quality that no one else had. Now, a lot of people have it. So, be careful what you uh, think is good. Because it's all smoke and mirrors. Anyway, be well, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the next one.